Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Among the world's more interesting and appealing primates are the vervet monkeys of Africa. Bright and energetic, they have a complex social structure involving not only families like this, where there are adults, infants, and juveniles, but also family groups interacting within the troop. The vervet survive in a delicate natural balance with many other animals of their habitat, including the African elephant, largest of all land animals, and giraffes, tallest animals in the world. There are also zebras, which roam the adjacent plains in great herds, and lions, one of numerous predators sharing the habitat. Recently, we were invited to observe an important study of the social behavior of vervet monkeys that has been occurring here in East Africa's Amboseli National Park, located in the southern part of Kenya, not far from Kilimanjaro. This is where extensive research concerning the vervet monkeys is being carried out in a vast habitat of grassy plains supporting many grazing animals and predators. Among the scattered acacia trees are the several groups of monkeys being studied by a young scientist who is a doctoral candidate in zoology from Cambridge University in England. She is Phyllis Lee of Palo Alto, California. Here we see the habitats of vervet monkeys in Amboseli National Park. These habitats consist of acacia woodlands and the edges of small swamps. In this area, I am watching the development of the young in three separate study groups. In particular, I am watching how they learn to recognize and relate to their family members. And now we'll visit my first group. In the first area, Phyllis Lee will visit the study group of vervets is the smallest of the three under observation. In this region, the terrain is dry. Water runoff from Kilimanjaro goes underground and only reappears at the surface in isolated areas. Thus, the vegetation here provides scanty sustenance for vervet monkeys. However, it is quite suitable for the antelope species, such as these Grant's gazelles and Thompson's gazelles. The Grant's gazelle is slightly larger than the closely related Tommy. Both species depend upon keen sense of sight and smell and on their speed to escape the lions that live here. These cubs are part of a pride that lives in and hunts throughout this area. The availability of food determines the length of the lion's stay here. So long as the gazelles and the other plains animals remain here, so will the lions. When the rainy season comes, the adults and their cubs will move on, following the migrating herds. Whenever lions are nearby, Phyllis remains safely in her car. Having left the lion pride far behind, Phyllis has reached her first study area. The acacia tree found here is the umbrella acacia, which is distinctive because of its shape. It survives well in the dry areas and provides a certain amount of food on a seasonal basis for the monkeys. In most cases, the vervet monkeys live in troops composed of related females and young and unrelated males. The young males, upon reaching sexual maturity, will leave to join other groups. Among vervets, the face becomes intensely black at the age of one year. Because the vervets are most vulnerable to some of their enemies when crossing open spaces, they usually do not dally until better cover is reached.
One of the best defenses the vervets have is their great agility. In this dry area, competition for food is so keen that there's not much opportunity for play like this. While these juveniles, age two and three, are siblings, unrelated young will also play together. There is a clearly defined social ranking among the vervets, and the more subordinate individuals always give way quickly to a dominant, sometimes with a certain amount of vocalizing. That sound signifies submission. Through close study of such actions among them, we can better understand the group's social structure. It is very rare for an encounter to escalate into actual fighting. In the vervet society, juvenile females are strongly attracted to nursing infants, which are always the focus of attention and guarded closely. Females usually have one baby annually and nurse it for a year. The vervets are constantly alert. Since their sense of smell is quite poor, they place great reliance on their keen vision to detect any approaching foes, such as the yellow baboons. These baboons are less agile than vervets in tree climbing, so it is on level ground where they pose the greatest threat. The yellow baboons will sometimes snatch an infant or juvenile vervet and kill and eat it. So when baboons approach, the vervets quickly make a silent exodus to safety. In studying the vervet monkeys, it is important to understand the animals that share their habitat, and this includes the baboons. They have a social life that is very much like that of the vervets, and they are easy to observe from the car. While many of the basic social interactions among yellow baboons are much the same as those of the vervets, these primates are much larger and range considerably farther. The baboon infants, like the vervets, nurse for about a year before becoming independent of their mothers for food. At six months of age, they begin riding jockey fashion on the mother's back instead of being carried underneath. Because baboons are larger and have better defenses than do the vervets, they move about in the open with a more relaxed manner. In this dry habitat, the baboons often eat roots that vervets are less able to dig up. However, food is easier for the vervets to find in the moisture habitat not far from here. There is a greater variety of animals in Phyllis Lee's second vervet monkey study area. Because it is a swampy area which attracts other species and large predators, she must be keenly alert for them as she continues her observations. It is here that the plains animals come to drink. In this area where food is abundant and competition less demanding, Phyllis Lee has observed some of the more involved and interesting social behavior of the vervet monkeys. This individual is a male about five years old who is just about ready to leave his family and go join another group. That won't be an easy matter since there is always some degree of rejection initially. These vervet monkeys of the second study group appear to be much more relaxed and playful than those we left in the more arid region. We have seen how the individuals in the first group spend most of their time feeding and have little time or energy for interacting. 
This second larger group exploits a richer swamp habitat and the variety of interactions rises dramatically. The stirring cries from overhead come from a fish eagle. These birds of prey do not feed on young vervets. They are simply attracted to the sort of oasis the swamp area provides. It is frequented by many of the larger animals, such as elephants and wildebeest. The swamp has the only water available for miles and draws animals from the whole surrounding area. It is a place where they come to drink and cool off in the pleasantly marshy ground. Among the many bird species that come here regularly are the Hadada ibis. Not far from me, a juvenile vervet appears to be interested in the offspring of an adult female. The infant is only about four days old and is essentially helpless. Juvenile females often want to touch and hold the infants, evidently to learn how to care for them. They cannot do so without the approval of the mother. Quite often, the two-year-old juvenile merely sits and watches. This is the troop's dominant male and female, also called the alpha male and female. Grooming is an important social function among the vervets and helps to strengthen the bonds between males and females. No other social interactivity is so common or so important as grooming with these animals. The practice, however, is not limited only to members of the same family. Vervets unrelated to one another often engage in grooming, usually with the subordinate animal grooming the more dominant one. Nevertheless, mothers frequently groom their offspring. Where food is plentiful, social interacting broadens, most noticeably with increased play. Open mouths signify non-aggression. Among yearlings, such play is very gentle. As the vervet monkeys grow older, however, play becomes rougher, as among these two-year-olds. When the juvenile males approach puberty, play becomes rougher still and may help establish dominance. Most observations are made during timed intervals and carefully recorded for later study and analysis. The vervets eat vegetation of many types, as well as materials such as birds, eggs, and insects, which places them in the category of being omnivorous. The young vervets quickly learn the fundamentals of locating the juiciest and best food. No matter what activity the vervets are engaged in, they are always alert for danger. In some cases, they even help alert me to the presence of a predator nearby. While lions do not usually hunt small prey like vervets, they do present a certain degree of hazard to observers. Thus, when a lion is nearby, common sense precautions dictate returning to the car. Part of the study I'm engaged in here has to do with the relations of vervets to other animals. Though there are some 600 elephants at Amboseli, they usually split into a number of different herds. Most of them have become accustomed to the vehicles of scientists researching here, 
and cause no problem, so long as the individual remains inside and doesn't get too close. The elephants tend to stay in family groups and pay little attention to the vervets, except when they approach too closely. Now, with the vervets here quietly feeding, we'll move on to where the third and final study group is located. Having left her second study group of vervet monkeys, Phyllis Lee has now arrived in the area with the richest habitat. Here, there is less danger of predators than at the swamp area. It is this third area, according to Phyllis Lee, that has the most food for the vervet monkeys. Here, grooming and play are even more prevalent. There are about 35 monkeys in this troop, and the higher population is a direct result of the fact that the animals do not have to strive quite so hard as the others to survive. This is my largest group. Here there are eight babies and many juveniles. The larger number of individuals in this group radically alters the structure of their interactions. For the past few days, Phyllis Lee has been watching a male vervet attempting to transfer from its own group into her study group. My study group of vervets are aware of the newcomer's approach and move toward him. The stranger, seeking admittance, has positioned himself on the end of a log, and the group pauses a short distance away to look him over. While the strange male may eventually be assimilated into the group, it will only happen if he has the persistence to repeatedly return after threats by the group have driven him off. For the most part, the vervets live companionably, thoroughly enjoying one another's company. But always there is the element of competition for dominance among them, even during the most sedate of activities. Competition for food often causes individuals to forage apart from the others. This juvenile has discovered a cluster of small insects on the palm leaves. Another is intent upon the eye flashing of a female who is interested in claiming what a nearby male is feeding upon. Eye flashing is a low level threat meant to drive away the more dominant male. Fearing that other group members may come to help her, he withdraws and avoids a possible fight. Competition really begins in earnest when the young vervet begins finding his own food. When the baby is a year old, weaning time comes. That's when the mother grooms him carefully even while he continues to suckle. This has the effect of lessening the trauma somewhat when she refuses to let him nurse anymore. The sudden cry is a leopard alarm, and no vervet monkey ignores it.
others echo the warning. Instantly, the vervets react and run for safety. They know full well that their enemy can follow them up into the trees, but not onto the higher, limber branches where they can go. The large leopard that inspired the alarm is still a considerable distance away. Though the excitement continues, some of the vervets now realize that the leopard is far off and is definitely not on the hunt. Some fear still remains, but will pass as the big predator moves off. Phyllis Lee's observations are ending for today, but the vervet study is far from complete. Vervets live in a complex social world. They have to struggle at times just to stay alive and as well must constantly react to the behavior of their other group members. Throughout their youth, they learn the various social skills necessary for them to cope with their world as adults. Occasionally, people will ask the question of what use is it for scientists to spend so much time, effort, and money studying the way animals live. The work of zoologist Phyllis Lee answers that question admirably. Africa's vervet monkeys have social and physical characteristics that strongly relate to man's. Through studies such as hers, we not only better understand the complex society of a whole species of primate, we also gain greater insight into behavior patterns relating to the human condition. Through such information, we become able to improve our own lot and to conserve natural habitat and the animals inhabiting it. The end result is that man's existence is bettered and he becomes more skilled at preventing disruption of natural balance so that generations to come may also benefit from the wonders of the wild kingdom.